basically bound to the to the aluminum silicate network, and the um, and the alkali metals are bound inside of these uh, aluminum silicate cages, essentially, where mm-hmm. the, the cations can't come out, and so they're chemically stable and don't leach. So if you go to a like an ASTM test of, of uh, that you would do with like uh, chloride imp- impregnation and stuff that they do for normal Portland cement to, to estimate how long the lifespan will be. These kind of materials will test out at being, you know, well over 500 year lifespans or like six, seven, yeah. 800 year cements. Tell me because about, they're more chemically stable. Yeah. Tell me about, I saw in the small video you made. So how did you make that? Geopolymer. That was a, uh, yeah, this was a, a long time ago, but that was a, a geopolymer binder, the, the kind I've just been telling you about, and I actually added some uh, silica fume, because it's a micro, well, it's a, silica fume's typically a nanosinosphere, so that uh, in that particular composite, I was using the the really small sinosphere as a little way to trap micro air, you know, or nano air bubbles inside of it. Silica fume? Um, and, yeah. It's a byproduct of uh, of uh, ferrosilicon manufacturing. It, it when some of the silicon gets oh. uh, essentially when it uh, vaporizes and then it'll condense up in the air into little teeny you know some spheres. They're, they're typically like between they're typically between like 150 nanometers and maybe one micron in size. So they're used in Portland cement as a as a supplement as well. Um, mm-hmm. So you did uh, geopolymer so, binder with silica fume, and I had some. Yeah, that was primarily a geopolymer binder with silica fume, nano aggregates inside of it, and chopped carbon fiber. Uh, fiber is what I was using there. Uh, that was something I built, you know, two or three years ago. I could probably do something a fair amount better now, but uh, just kind of give you an idea. But. Uh, and then induction furnace, you were asking me about what were you looking for as far as that application? Were you looking for something the metal would actually reside inside of? Yeah. An induction thing or just an insulation component? Yeah, the way we're looking at it right now. Uh, yeah, just a, a crucible. A crucible a or... Crucible. You could manufacture crucibles with this and with the binders. You might have to go to something that's more uh, technical in the ceramic side, like you might need to put a, a silicon nitride or a silicon carbide... Uh, type filler in with it, um, or a lot of graphite potentially, or something. But uh, I actually think I haven't done any of that myself yet. But I'm near positive it can be done. And um, you know, I think actually building crucibles and stuff like that would be you know an interesting application with it. So, mm-hmm. um, now, which we could even try. I mean, I'd be happy to build a resin and send it to you and. And we could, you know, try making some crucibles if that's ultimately what you're after. Or do a little research and see what kind of composite may work in the context of your um, uh, of your induction furnace. Okay, so what about getting to to steel temperatures? Because one application that okay, actually, this might be a good project. So finding a crucible that's easy to make, either machine or cast. Um, mm-hmm. And combine that with 3D printing. So, so, so one thing that I think has great potential for uh, decent DIY manufacturing is the sim- what I call MIG casting, which is the idea of using a crucible of a shaped form and using your MIG welder mm-hmm. simply to deposit the metal instead of. So this is before an induction furnace is available. So say you have a welder okay. and you have a 3D printer and you have you have your ability to make refractories, then you can get precisely shaped. Yeah. that you can well you know one of the other aspects with this material though is i mean and, and there are some applications where metals are just better but with a lot of fiber and you know and, and done correctly on a geopolymer composite you can get pretty close to what people think is being steel type of strengths i mean you can get to structural really structural materials pretty close like i could send you a picture i'll, I'll email you a picture of an older cementuous composite that was uh, like in the 1990s called ductile that's done by Lafarge. It's just a, it's a true Portland cement based composite, but with steel fiber in it and some other things. And if you actually compare like a steel beam that, you know, in a, in a, in this ultra high performance concrete beam of equal load bearing capacity, they're almost the exact same size. I mean, the webs are maybe 20% thicker with a ductile beam, but these type of steel ceramic fiber. they're so, not they're not really like concrete they're a lot closer to a you know to a pure to a metal 
then. So, uh-huh. and they're, you're only catalyzing these, you know, between, uh, you know, 120 and 200 degrees, uh, or there's even some room temperature catalyzed ones. So there's a lot of applications that could just be done without even, uh, you know, without even going to a metal. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is in the, in the more advanced composites, the metal oxides come out almost as strong as the metals and they're lighter, you know. Um, yeah. By the way, and they're uh, certainly probably stronger by strength to weight ratios. I have a question for you. Do you mind if I sure. record this so so that I no, can share fine. with the team? Because you're, you're giving us no, some really fine. good uh, technical info here that I think we can build upon. So yeah. Um, well, I've been looking at how to do this from scratch for about three years, yeah. and, and and actually experimenting with geologic materials. So I'm I'm quite a ways down the road and would be, you know, happy to share, yeah, definitely, definitely. you know, uh, tell me more information. About the, so. the steel fiber in the, in the material that you mentioned was, the, how thick are the fibers? Uh, in ductile, uh, type concrete, they're using, uh, oh geez, they're, uh, probably, um, uh, they're probably 13 to 15 centimeter fibers or something like that. Essentially what it comes down well, to is this, how, this how may thick, help you what, answer. What gauge? What this gauge? may help, uh, and, and probably, uh, maybe like a hundred micron or a couple hundred microns in size. So a quarter millimeter in, in, in diameter, maybe in 13 centimeters long or so. If I'm remembering right off the top of my head. Uh-huh. Um, the, the principle behind it is this in new composite huh. materials, what That's they're amazing. finding is, is it, versus, old ways of doing things where you have rebar and, you know, larger aggregates and stuff, what happens is, is you shrink the size of everything and you distribute it all throughout the mix. So you're distributing, instead of having one solid piece of rebar, you're having, you know, a bunch of steel fibers that are distributed, but they have more surface area and there's more interface between yeah. the matrix. Oh, yeah. And so... And so really, and, and like, so in, in, in the context of a ductile, like the largest fiber, or the largest aggregate they use inside of that as a concrete is probably like eight millimeters. And mm-hmm. there are some issues when you get down below about a hundred microns because the materials start to become more reactive and stuff. But really aggregates above a hundred microns or so, uh, all they do is what happens is that it, it introduces more opportunity for failure and for the failure to be larger in the material. So, the new material sciences is basically use a lot smaller particles, have a lot more surface area interaction that gives extra strength, and uh, it minimizes the failure. And really, that's the big thing is minimizing the failure within the composite material. So that you know, if you if you're starting out with the you know your largest aggregate being one micron versus or not one micron, but like say 100 microns versus a standard concrete that might have a three quarter inch rock in it, well. I don't know what the comparison to this would be off the top of my head, but it's probably like a hundred thousand times smaller or something like that, you know. So, so you or, or you know, or ten thousand times smaller or whatever. So essentially, the size of what your beginning failure will be starts out being ten thousand times smaller to begin yeah. with. Yeah, and, and it um, lowers the probability and everything as well. Right. So with the steel fiber, that's you said it's about 10, 10 centimeter pieces of the fiber, ten centimeters long. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something in that range. Interesting. It's a fairly flowing, self-consolidating type con- concrete, so it can pour into molds and get into, you know. But the stuff that I'm working with, I have some composites that I've done where the largest size aggregate, and it's been a well. I've had some that I've done large size aggregates, like down to 200 nanometers in size. I actually built the aggregates from the bottom, <laughs> from the bottom up using geologic chemistry, and they end up being about, uh, you know, 100 nanometers in size. Um, so. You, you can get crazy small stuff, but with those kind of things, other things you can like cast and and reproduce. I mean, if, if I took a, a plastic that was perfectly smooth mold and it had a little teeny scrape on the bottom of it, even if it's like a couple microns in size, this material will reproduce the scrape in the in the mold because mm-hmm. it's you know because you can cast that fine to detail because the the aggregates are so small you know depending on how you do it so it doesn't look like a normal concrete it's almost like a room temperature cured ceramic what was the aggregate in in there was that something like carbon fiber or uh the aggregate i was doing i I actually dissolved the aluminum and the silicate separately and ran it in a particular chemistry where actually it, it breaks down to literally down to you know one or two ions of 
silica and aluminum, you know, uh, down to that kind of breakdown almost to the atomic level, and then it rebuilds its way back up from the bottom up by natural assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you said... Uh, so that's, on the crazy, that's on the crazy outside, you know, end of this stuff yeah. that, that I've well, got distracted with sometimes. But. Go back to the geopolymer binder that you used when you uh -huh. made your geopolymer. What's the binder that you used? Did you get it off the shelf or did you make that? No, I, I made that. That's that aluminum silicate that I was telling you about where you take a, you know, a potassium silicate or a sodium silicate solution and combine it with another amorphous uh, you know, aluminum silicate, and that builds the binder. What happens is that... Uh, uh, amorphous solid? Uh, yeah, well, what, well the ones, it's a liquid. So you have typically a sodium silicate solution would be um, about... Uh, about 40% solids inside of it. Actually, it's 40% ions floating inside of a, of a solid in a suspension in a solution. It looks like a clear, clear liquid, but it, really about 40% of the mass is uh, actually mineral, and the other uh, and the other 60% is water. And then you're mixing that with a solid aluminum silicate. And what it does is the alkali uh, starts breaking that apart uh, and depolymerizes the silicon aluminum out of that. And then this all it goes into and it turns into a gel, and then the gel polycondensates and makes all these little nano aggregates that all glue together. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing you so made was a really good conductor, and the aluminum, the sodium silicate. Did you get that off the shelf, or did you make that too? I, I've made. I, I've been. Where I've been working with, I've been trying to short some things and getting to where I can get large volumes of precursors. You know, to, where you can affordably do, you know, housing and stuff like that. So. Um, I, I'm using what I'm doing is I'm using a pumice from Idaho that's about 100 miles away from here that I can get in large volumes. I, in particular, I was lucky with that because this is ultra pure. It's probably the purest pumice out of any resource in the world, and it just happened to be close to me. So that's what I've focused on a little bit. But I'm just taking that pumice, which is about 75% uh, amorphous silica and about 15% uh, aluminum content, and um, I'm uh, dissolving that in a in a, hydro, a, a hydroxide solution to make the potassium or sodium silicate, and then I'm combining that with additional pumice and metacalin mixed, you know, all these at particular atomic ratios and with particular molar concentrations of alkali in the water and stuff to control what happens. But um, that's how I'm building the base binder. And then you add, um, just like Portland cement, you know, you're adding aggregates and fillers and other things to make up uh, the difference, which usually the binder in typical Portland cement or, or uh, not the super high performance stuff, the binder is about 30%, uh, 25, 30% of the overall mix and the rest of its aggregates and fibers and, and stuff like that. Okay. On the higher performance stuff, the ratios are about flipped, so then you're usually uh, more like 60% of the paste slash binder and, you know, 30 or 40% 40 of, of fillers. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, where do, where do you do this? So so do you have a, a plant or just a, a company? A, that? Just a shop, you know, that I'm doing it at for myself. This has been mostly just uh, my, you know, sideline. My day job is I'm a real estate developer. So, um how much time do you spend but, on the real estate development? Is that like your full time, or you? You're yeah, I've, I've time? been. I, I grew up in the industry. I've been doing real estate development for over three decades. So, I'm, I'm primarily on the land side, but I've uh, land and entitlement. I've done um, uh, so a couple super fun site redevelopments. Uh, kind of more in uh, my specialty is more complex real estate uh, development that has environmental problems or some kind of thing that's, you know, impacting the, the land value and that if you can solve the problem and and, and uh, get the entitlements needed, that there's a, you know, large increase in value. So, so what um, you, were you doing uh, your work, your experiments, that's just in your garage shop or your building or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of that and then, but I've done some work too with, I mean, like Hess Pumice, they have full labs and stuff up there. So I, I go up there sometimes and do some stuff with them. With it's one of my main precursor suppliers, you know, so. Uh-huh. Uh, who is that? That's the guys who mine the pumice? Yeah, yeah. Hess Pumice. Yeah. They, they have a pretty good size operation. They have 
several million tons of reserves and they their business actually started out they don't do a lot of this kind of stuff they do a few different things with building materials but their business started primarily providing this ultra fine pure pumice for polishing uh, tv screens back in the day mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh you know silicon chips and stuff like that it's used as an industrial polish and and other applications it's used some for yeah. grouting and stuff now in mines and uh but they ship all over the world mm-hmm. so i'm thinking what would be an example like I would love to show the example of local production of cementitious material, and that's why I mentioned, okay, so we have limestone here, we can bake it to make lime, right, which gets mm-hmm. you back to cementitious materials. But do you think there's any simpler way to do it? Uh, simpler or? At the end of the day, well, it depends on what you have. Like I said, there is some particular types of clays and geologic materials that that don't even need anything done, you can just simply put a hydroxide with them and they'll make a binder. So it depends on what you have there locally. Um, I, I mean, I could go into some details of why you do what, you know, but I'd probably be getting the weeds by accident, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but there are issues like, uh, for example, you end up with stronger materials if... Um, you're using a sodium silicate versus just activating, like, say, a fly ash directly with sodium hydroxide instead. It gives you a different kind of material than if you activate it with the sodium silicate. It's kind of, uh, I guess the best way to maybe explain it would be is if you have a little bit more dilute precursors, you end up with a little, little better result. Kind of the same thing if you were to add a calcium uh, in a geopolymer mix where you have some kind of uh, part of it that might be more towards Portland cement chemistry or they, there's hybrids of these that you can do. Um, but if you do that, instead of using a calcium hydroxide or a Portland cement that's like, uh, you know, three calcium atoms to one silica atom, you're better off using a, a calcium silicate that's got like two silicate atoms to one calcium atom. It just... Uh, it, for some reason, I guess it has to do with not being overly consecrated and getting the uh, material dispersed in the matrix that you're building and stuff. But the kind of the, the lesser, uh, um, uh, the the more mild uh, chemicals uh, within the range of chemistry you're doing seem to work a little uh, a little better. Two silicate to one is better than, for example, three to one, or. Well, better than like saying if you put a if you were to take a geopolymer based binder and put say Portland cement in it or a slag, which you can do, but Portland cement, it just, the rheology is harder to work with. And, and, and because Portland cement, when it's made, it's three silica atoms or three uh, calcium atoms. The, the, the main molecule is typically three calcium atoms to one silica atom. And so it's got a lot higher percentage of alkali and, uh, and it's not as, um, and, and part of it has to do with solubility. Uh, if you, uh, calcium is not particularly soluble, by itself, calcium hydroxide is less soluble than Portland cement is, and it's even less soluble than uh, a calcium hyd- or calcium silicate that's got more sil- silica with it. It's easier for the chemicals to break the the bonds and the molecules. Um, so some of it has to do with things like that. Just it, it's probably as much related to forms of the compounds that are uh, more uh, soluble than others. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they can all be worked with. It's just uh, uh, you know, there, there's variations, and some are harder to work with than others, and and some give you a little bit better results. But um, so I could take a look sometime at what you guys have geologically available there. But that's kind of why I'd come back to this. Ultimately, it would be nice, like when you guys are going to do aluminum extraction anyway, you can take aluminum and put it with nitric acid, and there's a way to make the metacalin synthetically, so that um, and, and you can pull the silica for sure from there. So if you had an aluminum source and could divide it that way, you could make a synthetic metacalin, and you certainly can. It's not too hard to get uh, amorphous silica. Uh, silica doesn't dissolve in a lot of things besides, you know, it, it, silicas are generally resistant to acid, so you can leach everything else away and leave the silica behind, and then when you put it with a, a base solution, it will dissolve at that point. Um, but, you know, I... I don't want to make it sound overly simple. I mean, I know the general process. I play with a lot, but I don't. I, I'm not a chemical processing engineer, and I'm trying to muddle my way through it. I'm a, I'm a dumb developer. <laughs> Just playing, how'd you pick playing up with this stuff on the side. So, how'd you pick up on, uh, on uh, chemistry here, geopolymers? I've I've done 
some in the past. It's kind of uh, uh, it's kind of a funny story. I had a bunch of little things in my family we would call micro hobbies uh, mm-hmm. over my lifetime, and I kind of saw them as all being not related to each other. Uh, but then a few years ago, I kind of went studying. I was doing a development project that I just wasn't happy with how uh, how the buildings were being designed, and I was looking at the complexity of the uh, of the sound transmission ratios to the walls and what assemblies we had to do. And I, you know, been doing it my whole life, and I just said to myself, this wood frame construction just doesn't make sense to me anymore, you know. And I was convinced that some form of a cementuous housing was really what made sense, and so I went studying cement technology and. Uh, and, you know, went kind of into down this rabbit hole of, of chasing what sustainable technologies, how we just, what, quest, what makes sense to me to sequester carbon. And and kind of uh, was the question was, well, if I just kind of threw away everything I know about building and, and uh, you know, I've done a lot of some larger projects and I've been involved in urban planning and stuff like that. So I've been kind of through the whole range of it. I just kind of said, well, if you're going to throw everything we think we know about it away and start over, what? What would make the most sense to do, and that run down this rabbit hole that led to geopolymers. Um, but before that, I'd done, you know, since I'd done some electroplating as a, one of my family mentions as a micro hobby, and I'd done aeroponics and aquaponics and just different little, you know, projects that were hobbies. I thought, but uh, then then when I started looking at sustainable in this, I started realizing that, that that these things that I thought were all disrelated were kind of all key components to, you know, building technology and, and, and how, you know, my vision of how you might rebuild uh, things or do things in a lot better fashion, you know, they'll fit in, uh, which was kind of surprising to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had these things I'd done over 30 years that I thought I viewed as being all disrelated, and then all of a sudden I realized they were kind of all one part of a big picture, so. Yeah, so is Urban Forge a thing you started, a nonprofit you started? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a nonprofit I started here, and, and we actually only switched to a nonprofit format last year. And what the idea was is that um, some of the development companies and contractors and stuff I work with, they're all interested in doing good things, you know, things that could, uh, like things that would improve the environment in Utah and stuff like that. But um, there's not a, a lot of mechanisms to bring kind of these different talents together to, you know, to focus on some problem or solution or some project that would be a value to the community so the idea with urban forge was to form a company that i could take these relationships i have and then try to bring these different parties together to to do demonstration projects and other things uh like i have a, a 50 unit townhome complex that it's probably going to be about a year out before we get entitlement that i'm looking at doing that way and we're looking at using some advanced cement composites and i've been working with uh this group called the Gray Edge Group. They're the world's leaders in inter- thermal energy transfer technology and thermal networks. And we're going to, you know, look at integrating um, uh, energy transfer directly to the building structures. Uh, there were some advantages, even tax credit wise, doing that. Uh, What's but doing some kind of innovative projects along those lines. This is going to be like a townhome project that will have some urban, urban gardening component and, uh, you know, and uh, use about. 10% of the energy that a standard building would use and, and stuff like that. Gray water recycling, you know, all those kind of things all integrated into a commercial project. Yeah. Um, how do you fund Urban Forge? Is that you're just donating to it or or is that got a right? Yeah, that's, that's what I've been doing to date. Although what the plan is, is essentially Urban Forge may do a few things that generate some profit for it, but our, our focus is really on facilitating commercial you know, ventures or uh, for-profit ventures uh, or maybe even partially for-profit ventures. I mean, it, the focus is to do things that, you know, that make a difference, but uh, but people have to make money, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it's hard to drag, you know, my uh, my consultants and other things into doing something if they're at least not going to get, a, you know, a paycheck out of it at some point or a part of a paycheck out of it, what they would normally get. So um, that that's kind of the, the concept don't know how it'll work out, but so far, you know, been making some progress, and and uh, and and I have some pretty good uh, technical partners and stuff. Like I said, the Gridge Group; these guys are uh, literally they're doing uh, one of the colleges that they did here in Utah. They had about a million square feet. They did three years ago, and I've talked to their operations people, and their energy consumption at the college went down by ninety percent, or no, by eighty percent 
on those buildings. Um, but they're doing stuff like they're taking the heat uh, from air conditioning during the summer and then thermally storing it in, in a ground in, in, in the ground as geothermal storage, basically using the ground as a battery and then pulling mm-hmm. it out in the winter. So they're seasonally transferring energy and doing all kinds of uh, sensible, but you know, but uh, pretty advanced stuff. But it's all done with water-based heat pump technology. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's just you know, I, I you probably realize this. I know because I, I identify with some of the things I've heard you talk about, and you know work commercial businesses are and where education system is and yeah. and, and, and all of those things and, and there's some you know obstacles to getting stuff done but the truth is uh, if we really want to change the world as far as I can tell I went back and started looking and one of the questions was something that I think I heard you bring up in, in one of your talks I watched a couple in between uh, the, the time that I'd contacted you because I hadn't really kept that close of contact and didn't know how far you'd progressed with some of your stuff and things but um Anyway, uh, I forgot where I was going. I, I talked and uh, lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, but oh, I, 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 one of the questions I asked myself is like, okay, with the science that's already there, and especially stuff that's out of patent and stuff, what could we do? You know, I mean, and and what it really appeared to me is that we'll, we really haven't been applying science, and you know, had we really wanted to, probably from the seventies, we've had enough technology to probably feed and clothe the whole world if we wanted. If right, that was what yeah, our yeah. focus was. You know, but but for whatever reason, some of these technologies get stalled, and they don't. You know, because like geopolymers would probably be far more prevalent if it wasn't mm-hmm. for the Portland cement industry. You know, but they don't. Builders are traditional lot, and they don't like change. And yeah, uh, Portland cement think? will stay the same as long as it can, as long as it can still, you know, make a business. They're pretty resistant to change, and so. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, so it seems like you kind of see the need for integration and kind of like what what we talk about which is integrated technology talking about actual true yeah i mean where i'm ultimately heading with the housing thing is i think i'll be 3d printing houses probably at super high resolutions meaning down in a range that uh, you may even be able to have the physical structures interact with energy you know when you get down to feature sizes of a couple microns or smaller um you know uh, you can actually you know create physical texture on the building or whatever that'll actually interact with light and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, but I, I expect that uh, I'll be doing some kind of, you know, jetting of wall sections that'll have the wires in it and the plumbing's just devoid in the wall and all of that. And I'll be doing it and producing a better quality housing for half the price that you can do it today, you know, but it'll be built all in an integrated fashion. And that's probably part of my focus where I, you know, in my, in my development career, part of what I, and a lot of what I do is identify where there's synergies between different things and how you can, mm-hmm. you know, organize a project yeah. and, and leverage the synergies to create value. And, and uh, Tell me more know, about I think that's project. essentially so what you're saying. You where know, are you at on, on that project right now? Do you have a design? On which project? No, what you just uh, mentioned. Of integrating everything? Um, I've been doing... Uh, I'm a ways along. I mean, the part of it's this, uh, you know, manufacturing system for the geopolymers and whether I ultimately make it so I can build all my own precursors or not. Um, I'm working some with some people that are pretty well known in the 3D printing industry. Brooke Drum, who's founded PrinterBot, and uh, ASU is doing uh, some work for Urban Forge right now on designing a, a 3D printing paste. Uh, not that we couldn't design or haven't been a ways along, but there's a professor down there that has some methodologies that uh, we thought would help us uh, do a better paste, you know, a better end product than we might produce ourselves quicker uh, rather than doing, you know, uh, 5,000 tests, which, I mean, we've already done those kind of, <laughs> that volume of tests, but rather than, you know, just uh, going at it, uh, building a bunch of different uh, mixes with, you know, different variables and putting it in a matrix and trying to figure out what's, you know, going on and how to maximize strength. There's some, you know, numerical, or there's some ways to calculate, you know, based on particle sizes and particle packing and, uh, you know, distances between particles and stuff to come up with some formulations where you can, uh, and that's what I'm having them do to, to help optimize some uh, geopolymer pace quicker. Um, but they're doing one right now for a 3D uh, printer for us, and uh, and I'm a, we're a commercialization partner with them with uh, some research that's funded by the Department of Energy now using 
microstructures within walls and building envelope systems for you know for future things. So, Is this three D printing um, for things that have to be fired, or how how does that work? 3D printing paste? No, this is 3D printing of these geopolymer type materials that would just, uh, if, if they had to be, uh, if they needed to be catalyzed at all, there's some versions you can do, usually it's with, you have more calcium in it, you can get room temperature curing versions. If you don't have calcium in it, a lot of times you're curing it at, at like 40 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Celsius, so, you know, to, you know but something you could do inside an oven in a house, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Is that, um, is the printer bot collaboration on the printing pastes? Uh, no, that's just something Urban Forge is doing directly with uh, right now with uh, with ASU uh, Material Science Department. But uh, um, we're talking about doing some printer stuff with them. We're we're actually looking at um, what we're looking at is doing an extrusion based paste that could be you know in a in an extruder that could be done onto like a standard 3D printer. Uh, it'd probably have to be enclosed because you have to control the humidity levels and stuff and the heat levels a little bit more because uh, you need the water. The water isn't part of the geopolymer binder, but it needs to be there while it's curing because it's essentially the chemicals used for transport for the, for the polymers to reorganize themselves uh, as part of the curing process. But then when it's cured, all the water's dried out of it, and that's one of the reasons it's essentially a castable refractory or, or, or why it's so fireproof is because Portland cement has that the, has the hydration, has the water still integral to the chemistry when it's done, and then when it gets higher heat, you know, it, it causes it to spall and stuff like that. Where a, a geopolymer is, you know, is, is a refractory because it doesn't have any water in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the one, the one where you're working out the the paste, that's a project with ASU. Yeah. Now is yeah. that. Is that to be is that open source or is that no? We're we're trying to decide. I mean, I, I'm planning on doing most of my things open source, and so my my reticence on some issues is not that I don't believe in open source or doing it or that I want to be greedy or anything like that. But I, this will sound maybe a little bit strange, but on these more technical sides of doing things, I realized that where 3D printing is going and where these materials are going and stuff, there's actually kind of some scary stuff you could build. <laughs> <laughs> with it and I and I sometimes wonder like okay well what do I want to just put out there because you know would something be you know used in a manner that I wouldn't want it to be used um, what's I mean, more what's of that kind of concern if that makes any sense or not I don't know well sure but, sure um, but I mean in an open source world it's like we have our standard answer to that is anything could be used for good or evil it's up to people right um, yeah, no, and I and I've thought that same thing, so I I don't know, but you know, I mean, the other part about it is is that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, you know, I've got a family to support and other stuff too, and yeah, yeah. and I've probably spent more time than I have uh, should have on things like this. I, uh, you know, my development career, right, I took right. about a three year sabbatical, uh, you know, chasing this stuff, and I'm kind of getting back and doing some more development stuff, but, yeah, um, you know, so kind of what I've thought is this is that uh, I've been thinking is that. I would probably produce at least a, and in fact, the version that I have ASU working on now, we were planning on releasing as an open source version. And I was trying to look at whatever the most simple, but relatively strong composite, you know, slash printing material I could build would be. And then some other, you know, more advanced materials I might do within a for-profit company for now, at least, you know, like when I'm, and I'm talking about things like uh, composites that are, you know, with the, uh, carbon nanotubes and you know all more nano composite hot, super high in strength type material yeah um that stuff that i would probably leave on a commercial basis for now and do the more basic stuff uh, you know uh, open source so. with the pastes are you looking at the printable ref ref refractory materials for casting yeah, so what I'm looking at is developing, we're talking about developing a paste for two purposes. One, that you could put another, you know, type of nozzle system and stuff and use it on an enclosed printer or some existing, or maybe we'll develop another printer that can still open source the, you know, the material and stuff. Figuring a lot of people probably won't want to make it themselves anyway and will just order it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so no big deal there. But, um uh, and then we're also looking at doing a version that would be castable that you could take a standard FDM printer right now and print molding with it, you know, of some kind of part and then cast this material inside of it so that 
people could do something useful without having to even buy anything more than they already have. They would just take this as a resin, like a like an epoxy hydrocarbon, you know, type of resin, and and mix the couple parts together and cure it in the oven and have a high strength part that they could do something with. But not for metal. Uh, well, that would be a. Are you? That was a ceramic part that I'm talking about. But you can also that yeah, there are. Uh, especially like aluminum and stuff like that, you yeah. can cast aluminum. You can use this stuff for molds directly with aluminum and cast in it multiple times and have a high-resolution aluminum part out of it. So you can cast metals in, in the standard geopolymer. When you get into steel, you're probably going to need to have some different components inside of it, but you could use the same type of technology, um, but you're going to need a you know, higher temperature material. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there are ways to be able to use it. You know, I'm, I'm, I know you can, you know, we could use some variant of it, and you could build crucibles and stuff like that. And, and that's the kind of stuff that you could have be a profit center, too. I mean, I'm sure right. even like a, you know, like a graphite crucibles, you could use this kind of thing to build graphite crucibles with. I'm sure that would work for, you know, and, and I think those are, you know, somewhat expensive if you yeah. want to go buy one, you know. So uh, you could produce them pretty cheap, and, and uh, something like that might be able to be a profit center. But there's all, you know, when you get to a material that's a relatively strong i'm not saying that, that you know it's the ultimate material or anything but you know a lot stronger than plastic materials and it's and it's fire you know uh, pretty structural to about a thousand degrees celsius well it, it starts realistically it starts losing some strength up at 800 c but like you know for things like if you wanted to build a barbecue or you know a rocket stove or those kind of things they're all significantly lower temperature, so there's all kinds of things that you could build that would be, you know, really better than what's commercially available today with geopolymers. And essentially, they're a they're a fireproof refractory plastic. <laughs> so you'd say you know, you'd so they, see things like barbecues um, being geopolymer instead of metal. Yeah, you can easily do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. when you do these fiber reinforced, I mean, this, this stuff's pretty durable stuff. Uh, if you go on that geopolymer site and you look at uh, Trudy Cribbins, one of the leading researchers, she is the leading researcher probably in the U.S., and she gave a, a couple keynote talks a couple years ago, but she talked about in 2005 they they built, uh, they had this, she uh, was the chair at the American Ceramic Society, and they had this contest where they get students and stuff, and they build these coffee mugs, and, and two, up to 2005, and they take them and they drop them, and they put liquid in them and see if they were cracked and it was a contest amongst the people there to see you know how how far you could drop these uh, coffee mugs and and still have them uh, work well in 2005 she decided to do on a geopolymer and they did it with geopolymer and then like a carbon fiber fabric and and then you know did several layers and uh, of a fabric and then pressed it and it looked like a you know it's ceramic on the outside it looked like a coffee mug but uh, was, you know they started out at the three feet five feet seven feet they got up to 12 feet uh, you know, and, and the record had been seven feet to that year, and they finally couldn't get it to break, and they took it up to the fifth story of the building and dropped it off the fifth story of the building, and it bounced and still was not broken. So that's a geopolymer. Um, yeah, mixed with a what? geopolymer with a fiber composite. Yeah, what kind of fiber? It, uh, reinforcing, but yeah, it, you, you know, can, you build some pretty impressive stuff. So you could build a, a barbecue that you know that would be insulating and would have. I'm a barbecue guy, so that's one of the reasons I mentioned that one. I guess you're in Kansas, so you, you by default, should be a barbecue person, right? Yeah. Close to Kansas City. Except I was born in <laughs> Poland. Uh, oh, that's right. You are from Poland, yeah. But, oh. um, you know, so there's uh, there's a lot of different applications you for see, the material. Uh, that can could, you do that, that uh, maker type of mentality and that people could, you know, make products and that would be commercially well, viable. Yeah, yeah. And, How about, um, what about flameware? Would this lend itself to that? I don't know. Well, yeah, you could. I, I don't. I guess I don't know. You could probably. It depends on the size, and you can. It is really good at fireproofing. I, what I can tell you is this: is I've done some composites that surprised me using uh, microbeaded foam, where about fifty percent of the you know the material was a foam, so it's an ultra lightweight. But I put fiber and a geopolymer resin with it all mixed together to make a matrix. And at one point, I I run the same test that I had had shown you know that video I'd sent you, and I assumed with like 50 percent you know polystyrene content in it that it would just melt apart and fall apart real easy. Um, but actually, it only penetrated maybe like a millimeter into the composite and off-gassed a little bit when it got to that polystyrene. But 
essentially potassium silicate, and, and I was using potassium, which is probably better at flame resistance, but potassium silicate is what they use for uh, fireproofing woods and, and you know, and, and stuff that's similar they're using for, you know, uh, insulating steel beams inside of high rises and stuff like that. They, it's similar chemistry to what this geopolymer is anyway. So uh, it's surprisingly, as I mentioned from the polystyrene, it, it way exceeded my expectations on that. It's really good at fireproofing uh, things. I would have uh, totally assumed that that polystyrene thing would have just melted apart, hmm. you know. Um, yeah. But the but the geopolymer, you know, even with it being almost fifty percent polystyrene, the geopolymer actually kept the polystyrene from melting and could protect it. So yeah, so it's is a, there? it's pretty good on the refractory side. Mm -hmm. Is there something? So I, I don't know what that means as far as heat resistant materials. If you could impregnate, you know, impregnate some car or you know cotton or something, and have something that was more heat resistant, or what you're. You know, think if you're thinking clothing or something well, like that, I'm but thinking, certainly woods and other stuff, you know. Yeah, one one practical thing I did think about is flameware. Just printing flameware with a 3D printer that would be a great application. So flameware meaning like cooking, uh, a cooking pot. A, oh, a cooking pot. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I don't know with that. I guess the practical thing with that would be uh, thermal transfer. But yeah. you could use a material. You know, you could do it with a high carbon content or uh, or a quartzite. Uh, you know, or quartz that's, that transfers thermal energy well and have something that you might be able to do that way. I've never never tried it. I'll tell you what you can do that's interesting is you can take a you know, composite that's got a high amount of quartz in it. Essentially, you can bury an, uh, a nichrome wire inside of it and make a, a ceramic heater out of it. It'll re-radiate the heat, so you can essentially, it's, you know, you can build a quartz uh, radiator just bearing nichrome instead of a composite with a high amount of quartz in a geopolymer. A geopolymer composite with a high quartz, yeah. Yeah, because the quartz quartz re radiates infrared mm -hmm. in energy, you know, in that bandwidth between about uh, what was it, uh, you know, about one and three microns or so of wavelength uh, that that uh, infrareds in. It, it it naturally re radiates infrared really well. That's why they use it for you know quartz heaters and stuff like that. And I think essentially a quartz heater is a you know, a, a quartz composite with nichrome or some other wire buried inside of it, and then it just more evenly distributes the the heat out, out of it. But you can, you know, I've done it before. You can uh, take a geopolymer composite with high silicon or with high quartz content or quartzite and bury nichrome inside of it and make a heater with it, like an integral, you know, heater. For three D printing, are there available materials? For casting aluminum right now so what would we do say say we wanted to print forms for aluminum casting uh yeah you could do that all you'd do is you'd, you'd actually just kind of flip it you'd print the positive you know like the positive in part of a mold structure uh yeah. with the, you know with like your abs and then and then uh, you know vapor smooth it if you want to or whatever and then pour the geopolymer to make the mold with it you know, you pull the geopolymer against that and make the mold from it, and then you you know remove the plastic and then pour the pour in aluminum. But you could even do it as a lost wax type process if you wanted to. But the way I've done it is you know building like two part molds, but then you kind of well, what about uh, printing? You know, you're kind of making half mold and a half positive with the FDM print or with your 3D print, and then you're creating the geopolymer mold from the 3D print, and then you're pouring, and then you could pour the metal theoretically into that. Right, but what about going directly to the to the uh, negative form printed from geopolymer. Uh, I I haven't done that yet. I mean that's what I guess what I'm working on with uh, with uh, ASU may lead to that. Mm -hmm. But they're working on an F. You know a a, a, uh, a paste mix that's extruded. You, you don't get the kind of resolution as you you know do other forms. Um, where you could do it, and where I'm where I think I'm probably heading to is with some of the n materials, um, I'm trying to think how to explain this the quickest and, s and simplest. The, the viscosity of a material uh, is generally uh, most impacted by the diameter of the particles that are inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, it's directly related to the shear stress and stuff, and it has to do with the, the most dominant figure in those calculations is the, is the particle size. Mm-hmm. So when you get some of the geopolymers that are really, you know, where, they're, where most of the materials way down in these, you know, really small ranges, you can get something that's very fluid. Um, you know, like if the composites all blow one micron, you know, it's, it's, it can be almost as runny as water sometime or close. And I'm thinking that I can get to a composite that I can jet out of uh, industrial inkjet, you know, heads. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you would be able to get the kind of surface finish that you want, you know, that would allow you to cast a high, you know, a very smooth aluminum or something directly in, uh, in into a geopolymer mold or something. But with an extrusion-based method, you you know, you'd either have to do some sanding on the geopolymer or something to, to, to you know, smooth out. Or, or if you don't care about how it looks and it's just about function, then... Yeah. Yeah, what you could probably print the geopolymer mold or something, you know, Yeah. Uh, directly. What do you think about the concept of, if we have, because I've been thinking about, okay, I want to go 100% uh, zero carbon renewable structure, so we've got the CEB press, that's good, but we need some stabilizer, uh, we can have trees that are low carbon, but if I want to take limestone um, and my, do PV, okay, ahead, the PV, okay, the PV um, calcining uh-huh. of limestone, so, uh-huh. Uh, so basically, get con- uh, DIY concrete or solar concrete where you're just burning using using PV as the heat source to to get. Well, the, okay. The, the the, my thought on that is is this: you can do that, um, and you can do it with the calcium. But you know, real concrete, uh, calcium hydroxide, it, the cements that are made with calcium hydroxide, it's kind of like lime. Before you know, in, in his, historically, when they've used that as a building material, sometimes they would slake the line for a year beforehand because it's so uh, because the solubility is so low uh, to use it as a material and as it develops strength it develops like even in the Roman concretes and stuff that actually they were probably at least 50% geopolymer chemistry anyway but they developed strength a lot slower because they were using uh, you know a calcium hydroxide uh, as a basic part of their binder so that's the challenge with doing that. And I know you can get solar and do it because to get the, you know, to reduce calcium carbonate's pretty easy at a lower temperature. But in order to do a cement where you're actually binding this, you know, the calcium with silica, you need to be more like 12, 1300 degrees Celsius or so. And I'm not sure whether you can do that, you know, if you wanted to make a typical Portland type cement type cement. Um, what I've been looking at is kind of a whole different thing. There's the... And and I and my so my solution may be a little bit different than yours, but I've been following um, some uh, ionic liquid chemistry related to molten carbonates, and there's a way to electrolyze uh, essentially in a a mixture of a sodium potassium lithium carbonate um, in, in an electrolysis cell, and you can split carbon dioxide off, so you can calcine the carbon and the carbon um, dioxide that's released during the calcining, you can electrolytically split that into oxygen, and the carbon will will self deposit as carbon nanotubes at 750 degrees Celsius. So it's actually a way to do a zero, uh, a carbon neutral, or even potentially a carbon negative material. And then there are some ways to use the calcium hydroxide, and uh, essentially it's an ionic liquid, you know, water-based chemistry where you can swap, uh, you know, the hydroxide with a carbonate from, say, sodium carbonate or potassium carbonate. And and so there's some chemical, you know, replacement reactions and stuff you can use. And that's kind of the path that I've been looking at heading down is using the carbon or using the calcium more as a tool uh, for some other chemical reactions to produce the geopolymer. For instance, um, there's a lot of uh, potassium, uh, well, a lot of sodium carbonate here. There's the world, some of the world's largest dep- deposits are in Wyoming that are within about 30 miles from Salt Lake City. And, you know, historically when they made soap and stuff, uh, the primary, you know, at potash, you know, when they burnt hardwoods and stuff was potassium and sodium carbonate as well. But if you take a calcium hydroxide with a sodium or potassium carbonate, there's a double displacement reaction. You end up with you'll end up with a sodium hydroxide and a calcium carbonate. Um, so uh, that's kind of the path that I was heading. And then you can take that calcium if you wanted to and recalcine that and split the carbon off of it as well. But uh, 
if you want to look into that, Dr. Lick at University, Lick at University uh, at George Washington University has been kind of a leader in that research stuff. I think it's one of the most transformative technologies okay. because, uh-huh. you know, most of our carbon reserves in the world are actually a good portion of them in carbonate rocks. And you literally, if you wanted to get the carbon out or excess carbon out of the air, you could take that methodology. You're making carbon nanotubes that are, you know, highly valuable and good for structural materials at the same time, sequestering the carbon that way. And if you took the limestone after you calcined it and threw it back out on the ground, it'd suck the carbon right out of the air again, and you could recalcine it. I mean, it's a way to actually, um, a, a legitimate way that you could just pull carbon back out of the air in industrial scale if you wanted to do it. Uh, is that pretty much space age stuff, or are we pretty near to to making the nanotubes that way? I mean, this uh, like... they're going to commercial. I'm, I mean, it's close enough that I'm following and planning on building something myself to do it. It's in electrochemistry that I've, I told you I've done some electroplating in the past and stuff. So it's just a little bit hotter temperatures than I worked with, but I have little doubt I could do it. I'd followed a bunch of different people that were researching similar things, but he's in fact uh, that. It's, it was called CO2 to carbon nanotubes. They may have won the X Prize last year for yeah. it, but they're uh, about that. Uh, you know, they've scaled up to several tons a day of carbon nanotubes, I believe, and they're about to head to industrial production with that oh, methodology. But oh, then yeah. there's, how, it's how not just I... that, but there's all other kinds of stuff that you can do with that molten carbon chemistry-related energy and stuff. If you run it a little bit hotter, you can end up with carbon monoxide and do water gas with it and, and, and other things but uh, I, I think it's one of the more interesting technologies out there and it's fairly you know fairly well known and advanced and Dr. Licht as far as the carbon nanotubes I have you know How far, little I, doubt I, I, that, I took a uh, that I could produce this cell that, that would you know produce the carbon nanotubes within you know a few weeks of actually making the effort to put together a system to do it so so are you saying that the, the information there is with uh, the G- George Washington University work. I mean, it's open enough right now that the technology is pretty much accessible. Yeah, I mean, I, it's accessible enough that they've given the, uh, you know, the the ratios of lithium and potassium carbonates that they're using in their in, in their ionic liquid and which metals work the best for you know making uh, hmm. making the nanotubes and what temperatures are ideal and you know. Is, a good is, portion uh, of the information is available. I'm sure there's some things that may not be published, but the vast majority of it is so are they publishing that i mean because typically you know like all these all the trade secrets and all that are they um required to publish that or are they trying to be good to the world or what's or this is i think they're trying to probably be more good to the world but i'm not sure i mean uh i've been going to contact him but he, he's probably was next on my list after you of people that i've been thinking about well you know like you, I thought about contacting for a couple of years. I kind of knew you guys back then. I thought, oh, that, that, what they're doing is really interesting, you know, and mm-hmm. maybe I ought to talk to them sometime or, or whatever, but uh, I finally got around to you, so maybe I'll get around to Dr. Lick to your place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think actually there's a real synergy between that technology and making the carbon nanotubes and then being able to use the chemical displacement reactions to manufacture geopolymers. So there's yeah. a synergy there that I see, and actually I'm going to try to contact him because if if he was open, you know, to consulting or working somehow, I'd rather shortcut the experiment and go to the person who's, you know, knows the most about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just just going back to the, the limestone and lime production, mm-hmm. you said that at the lower temperatures, there's two ways to do it, one at high and one at low temperature? Well, no, they, they both will happen at low temperature. What I was saying is that Portland cement and actual... You know, if you're trying to get something more like Portland cement, takes a higher temperature because it's a calcium silicate. It's not a calcium oxide. Right, mm-hmm. right. But I'm saying uh, for, I mean, lime has certain use already, like lime stabilization of CEBs for some soils that works really well to get completely waterproof. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you certainly can do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. My focus is, and maybe I'm a little crazy this way, you know, mine's been... Rather than kind of looking backwards to technology, I don't, you know, that, that's well proven. I've been looking, well, what, what can you do that's cutting edge, you know? Mm-hmm. So I've kind of been looking towards higher strength materials and faster processing and stuff. Like, for instance, with the geopolymers yeah. in a mold and stuff, depending on the, the, the um, parameters that you catalyze it within, you can actually have materials that you can mold and, and demold that are high strength with like in 30 minutes of a mold. I mean, in 
geopolymers obtain their strength a lot quicker than Portland cement based hydrate materials do. Mm-hmm. So they they may they the pure ones will end up with about eighty or ninety percent of their strength in twenty four hours versus twenty eight days. Mm-hmm. So you know so they're able to demold if you're molding it. It's you know a lot quicker manufacturing process. I mean even the bit of it. Some of the first stuff that he did with this it was a, a, a wall system called Sill Face. They did in the seventies, and in that system the uh, the heating and poly condensation time, I think, was only like 30 seconds a panel because uh, it was, you know, they were even at a higher temperature. But uh, yeah. so that there's a lot of ways you can you can work, but there's some inherent advantages, I think, to the geopolymer technology. Yeah. And underneath it all, you know, silicon and aluminum are more abundant crustally than uh, calcium is. Yeah. And yeah. and the calcium only uses a small amount of silica whereas a geopolymer is using an alkali earth there's generally like four silica atoms for every alkali atom so it chemically it, it stretches the more abundant materials further than the portland cement does just inherently right and, sure. and even even if you were going full manufacturing and stuff it's only about uh, it's probably 80 percent less co2 emissions because it's all done at lower temperatures and stuff than portland cement is right Right. So it's, it's fundamentally greener anyway, but I'm looking at, well, could you make it actually carbon neutral or carbon negative, you know, um, maybe even including transport and everything, there might be a way to, you know, ultimately get to, you know, some yeah. really significantly green materials. Yeah, absolutely. So would there be anything um, you could suggest for us to, okay, as far as any building products and, I don't know, maybe you can take a look at what we have available here and maybe make a suggestion on a geopolymer experiment that we could do here and possibly develop towards materials, building materials. Yeah, what, well, I guess you would mentioned that, you know, I don't know how close you were to working on your, uh, you know, your uh, induction furnace. You know, we could work on, on, on something for that. Um, I kind of had been looking at, um, and, and you might end up, probably the thing I would look at first would be maybe a lucite base that you would actually fire use a geopolymer material that you'd cast and then fire and densify it, you know, for something that you're using in a super high temperature thing. You might end up something that, you know, is inside of an induction furnace that takes a little more processing. Um, but that might also, I've been thinking about pursuing that myself as whether you could use it on the liners for like a wear machinery, like a ball mill liners and inside of a ball mill or uh, different applications like that just in machinery um, and processing equipment and things. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so that's uh, something I've considered. And then maybe another area that would actually be one that I think might be low-hanging fruit for you and that I haven't done a lot with yet is that these the pourable composites, um, essentially like the one I'm working with, with uh, Hess pumice, is the pumice is essentially granite that it was granite magma that, that got cooled too quickly and, you know, stayed amorphous versus being, you know, cooled slowly into the ground and crystallizing. So essentially, in in some of those composites, what I'm building is a synthetic granite. It's even a little stronger than granite is, but one of the best applications for that is is uh, machinery, like CNC machines and stuff. The highest end CNC machines are made on granite bases and stuff, yeah. but they're like million-dollar machines. It's because the granite's about five times better at dampening vibrations than cast iron is. Right. So uh, maybe integrating some, you know, a geopolymer composite into... You know, some of your printer, you know, your 3D printer uh, frames, or maybe you make an enclosed heated, you know, 3D printer and use it as the, you know, insulating material on the outside and um, and, and structure at the same time. Something like that yeah. might uh, be some kind of project, you know, that would make sense for you right now. Um, no, I'm not really sure. I can take a look at your website, too. But uh, Yeah, yeah. You know, anything that you could build with a refractory that, you know, that, that uh, could be relatively strong and stable. I mean, you wouldn't want to build one of your tractors necessarily out of it, but uh, there are probably a lot of other applications it could potentially, you know, fit into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not that familiar with everything you're doing, so. <laughs> right. Um, um, but I think that, you know, like, like that, uh, like machine frames and stuff like that could be, you know, an interesting application. And, and potentially you could even get lightweight stuff where you, you know, if you were doing like, essentially you can use the material also to lay up like carbon fiber, similar to a hydrocarbon, you know, based lightweight carbon fiber composite, but with a fireproof material instead. 
and do similar type composites and similar type of lightweight structures with high strength and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it could be interesting maybe for, you know, building a big gantry. It, it's yeah. lightweight, you know, that you, you could move quicker in, in terms of machinery and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I so, like I, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> frames. No, frames. Let's maybe uh, see if we can tackle that. So, uh, what, would, what specifically would you propose for that? Do you, do you have a concept that you thought would be... Uh, maybe uh, let's no, I mean, essentially, you'd just be looking at building some molding, and, you know, if you were building a, like, if you are building a gantry, you know, building some kind of truss-type molding or, or, or some kind of molding package and, you know, and, and, and or lay up and, and building a gantry or, or a machine frame, you know, or even, uh, out of yeah. it. Or even make that 3D printable and then fill it, portable composite. Yeah. That, well, I mean, that's another application I've looked at too. Actually, by the way, is one of the things I've looked at is taking lighter gauge steel than you might use for building a machine or something like that. So getting like 16th inch wall, mm -hmm. but then using a lightweight kind of foam geopolymer composite, putting it in the inside, and seeing well how much could you? Because I know that will significantly mechanically strengthen something like that, and you might find that uh, you know that's kind of a hybrid path to get to a you know lighter weight but a lot stiffer machine. And something you could cut back on metal usage, not have to have something that's so heavy that you, if you were just doing a solid, you know, welded frame. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you wouldn't weld it the same way, but just, you know, kind of the principle of like a foam bat with plastic around the outside right. of it, just using a composite, you know, formulation to give yourself more strength because it'll be strong in compression and using a material like a light steel on the outside that's a good intention. And as a composite structure, it would, uh, you know, that would probably work pretty well. And you can even do things like, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you or someone else that I was talking to recently, but you can actually take and tailor the, the thermal expansion of the material um, by controlling the ratio of the alkali metals in it and which ones you use, because the lithium is the smallest, uh, although it's in, inside this framework when it's done you know, on an atomic level, lithium smaller than sodium, that's smaller than potassium, that's smaller than cesium. Cesium, essentially, if you put a cesium geopolymer mix, will have no thermal expansion practically at all. Um, but you can also mix ratios of those and match the material. So if you wanted to have a geopolymer uh, composite that you wanted to composite with a steel and you wanted to you know, not have a problem with thermal expansions being different, you could actually tailor the thermal, uh, the thermal expansion of the geopolymer to match the steel and then make a composite of the two of them. Uh, could you see uh, steam engine, modern steam engines, as liners for the cylinders? Yeah, I, saw, I mean you I could do that anything then. like that. I, I think you could actually do full ceramic engines. This, the the processing ultimately, and that's where Trudy Cribben, she was, you know, a, a ceramic engineer. But you, this is actually there's a lower temperature way and probably a better way than typical ceramic processing. That just because you don't have to, it's not you don't have to double fire it. It's a single you know, lower temperature to get to a, a green body okay, or a hard so body that actually a... has structural properties. And then you can fire it after that to even densify it more if you want to. But I, I'm pretty comfortable that you could probably even do, you know, a, a full ceramic engine if you wanted to eventually, you know, if you worked with the composites correctly and had the, you know, tooling and molding and everything figured out, you know, so it, it's that kind of strong of material. Okay, that's so. that's very interesting because we do plan on making making engines. I mean, that's part of the set. Like right now, we have a modern steam engine on a plate, but I do see, like for example, for next year, we're going to get a bunch of. Do you know the Changfa diesels, the one cylinder, long life diesels from China? Uh, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, but, uh, we're yeah, looking at no, generally what you'd be talking about. Yeah, yeah, but this very simple one cylinder diesel. So we were looking at okay, let's mm -hmm. build those first. I mean, that's practical. Um, we'll probably get there faster than a modern steam engine. But yeah, the, the engine. Yeah, I've ceramic wondered with some of this, you know, with some of this molten carbonate chemistry. I actually mm -hmm. think that there may be some stuff that it, that makes more sense with direct electric conversion because you can burn actually fuels. I think there's a path actually, as long as you could keep the contaminants out of the fuel, you could burn the fuel directly in an electrolytic cell, like I was talking about. Actually, you know, as soon as the fuels got in contact with the molten carbonate, they would, you know break apart and release the thermal energy into the carbonate and and there's ways to convert you know a, a couple different methods you could use to go to direct the electricity so uh, i wonder whether that uh, some kind of multi-carbonate ceramic engine or something like that <laughs> i know that sounds a little bit crazy but uh, i wonder if, it, if there might be a better path than an internal combustion engine that would be more efficient because they're not in one factor they're not bound by the same uh, 
physics, I don't believe, um, you know, like some of the different methodologies with, that are bound by Carnot efficiencies and stuff like that aren't, uh, some of the different methods aren't, uh, in the chemical, electrochemical stuff aren't bound by the same restrictions, so they can be ultimately more efficient. Are you thinking of carbon and fuel cells are different? It, it, the, the chemistry of what I was talking about, it's, yeah, it's almost the same thing as a molten carbon at fuel cell, actually. So mm -hmm. uh, the when I'm talking, it, it, practically very little difference. There's, you know, there's molten carbon at fuel cells. There's, uh, you could burn this directly and take thermal heat off of it. If you burn Are it at a higher burning? temperature, there's some interesting things you can do with it. There's a silicon, I think it's a silicon ion uh process that you can run with vaporization and, and generate electricity what and then the you can water it to critical steam and you know there's some different me some methods can you back up so. a little bit what's in the cases that you're talking about like for the molten carbonate what, what is the actual fuel what are you burning well you could the thing is is if you can if you can capture the carbon out of it like mm -hmm. uh like dr look's been able to do at those temperatures which you know is well proven yeah you can split the carbon and essentially they're, they've done the thermodynamic studies and published them, but it's essentially you split the carbon and you can take the oxygen off of it. It'll split on, if you're using a two, uh, a multi-cell uh, electrolytic cell, mm -hmm. you can pull the oxygen that splits off of it and refeed it back into the combustion. They've shown actually that you can, uh, that you can actually, if you're using a process like that, go to zero emissions and actually increase combustion efficiency even on an existing power plant using technology like that. I see. Yeah. So, and so I, I, my my uh, hypothesis is that as long as the fuel is cl pretty clean, like say for instance, uh, uh, natural gas, as mm -hmm. long as you didn't have much sulfur and stuff in it, you could. Uh, I think you could burn the natural gas directly into the you know to the carbonate solution and split the carbon dioxide off and and, and recycle the oxygen uh, that way. And there's some interesting things you can do with you know at the higher temperatures, like splitting water and other things are uh, more efficient. Um, so there's, there's kind of a lot of interesting things in and around it if you start exploring the, the chemistry and stuff. Molten carbonate fuel cells being one, but it, you know, if you have other materials that you're splitting and you're splitting hydrogen off, then you can run the hydrogen into a, you know, an old-fashioned hydrogen fuel cell that are pretty available and the stuff's pretty cheap now, you know, as far as components to build um, you know, a fuel cell out of something like that. Um, Any relations to, okay, so just plain electroly electrolysis of water to make that more efficient, like with these materials? Uh, there are some things that are in question that I've been doing, but I, I couldn't say for, you know, for sure. I, I've, uh, there's some chemistry with iron in relation to these materials as I've been processing and I've been talking with some uh, a different professor down at ASU, but there's some reduction in oxidation going on with iron in silica and water that appears to maybe be a lower temperature iron based catalyzed splitting of water but but uh, that that's probably beyond my uh, I, I've seen enough to think that it's probably happening and have some things I can point to because you can see the physical color changes as that iron you know uh, as it reduces into different forms of iron hydroxides and stuff the colors change so you kind of know what's going on but uh, um, but I, I'm not a chemical engineer at the end of the day, so. yeah I, I, yeah. I just uh, play around with the stuff of, you know, someone who's not, uh, who's dumb enough to think they can jump in water over their head and swim and have done it most of my life. So yeah, I, no, that's a good approach. I, prob I, I probably, <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably do things that I shouldn't be doing, but uh, anyway. Yeah. So where do you go from here? Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I, I guess I'd be happy to look at, uh, see what you guys might have around for local resources. I think that might be a place to start. You know, we could look at, yeah. especially if you have, uh, you know, some particular like, type of geologic material that might be easy to work with, or if you have a coal-fired power plant that's close by, that there might be fly ash from that could be bought in pretty cheap and processed some way. Essentially, you'd just be looking at what, you know, amorphous aluminum and silica uh, type geologic deposits or industrial waste might be around your area i've done a little work with waste glass that's another one that that uh you could for sure build a silicate app that would be cheap way to do it by the way i guess because you can uh, the only challenge is with the, the calcium and the glass is there to specifically to make it uh, less soluble uh, so you'd probably have to leach out the calcium first but uh there's a couple different ways you could do that. Um, 
sodium, well, like I said before, uh, you could do it with a, a hydrochloric acid leaching or a, a oxalic acid's pretty good at, at uh, leaching calcium out of a silicate as well. But that once you got the calcium leached out of it, uh, you could build a, a silicate, uh, sodium or potassium silicate with waste glass. Um, oh, wow. It just happens to be here. I haven't spent a lot of work on that because the pumice is essentially a glass and it's just as pure and it doesn't have the calcium in it and I can buy it for $9 a ton and if I work with the, the glass recycler here who's the main glass recycler in Salt Lake, they want $60 a ton for their material and, I had, and I'd have to mess with it some more so I just haven't spent a, huh. a, a lot of time focusing on that. But so I have are, made some good so composites saying, using some waste glass as part of the mix and, and processing it. I just haven't focused on it. So, but so I, you're I know saying it's possible. in that one, in summary, water glass out of waste glass? Yeah. Interesting. Huh. And there's some, there's probably several studies out there you could run into that talk uh, about approaches to do that. Hmm. Yeah. So waste glass would be one of the more obvious, you know, that'd, I think targets. Interesting. Uh, it's pretty available most places. So that'd probably be, you know, especially if, you know, if we wanted to come up eventually with a formulation based on waste glass or something, that would be something that would be, you know, good to open source and could be used a lot of places yeah, in the world. Yeah. Another thing that we think a bit about, like simple paint, like we looked at water glass paints, but we're trying to figure out a low cost way to 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 seal wood or 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 the CBs or like CB floors or whatever. Yeah. Basically, paint replacements using water glass. So that's that's good stuff to to figure. Yeah, out. no, and that's I've heard really good things about those paints. I haven't studied that a whole bunch, but. I understand that there were some silicate-based paints that were used in, uh, like in the Netherlands and stuff, and that some yeah. of them they, they bind really well, the same way geopolymers do to organ or to you know to geologic materials. But I understand there's some paints that the paint jobs have lasted over a hundred years on brick buildings there, right. uh, because it you know it, it, it's such a strong. But I, I I would think that'd be pretty easy to do based on what I've done. I haven't ever tried it, but I'm sure it's just some mixture of a sodium silicate along with some mineral colorant and you know, and some other fillers. Um, and I'm also sure that, uh, you know, uh, sodium silicate's the common thing they use to densify cement. You know, it'll go and react with extra calcium inside there and stuff, and I'm sure it would densify your uh, your compressed earth bricks and stuff as well mm-hmm. and add strength to it. So yeah, uh, I'm confident it would work that way, so I think you're on the right track there. But if I were doing that, I'd probably just start out with... Uh, I'd probably start out with something made from a waste glass. I'd look at that and putting waste glass, maybe even integral to your brick process as you make it. Mm-hmm. And then maybe some additional on the outside even, but uh, that would be a pretty uh, viable way to, you know, maybe get your bricks to be a little bit stronger and, and densify them a little bit and stuff. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, this is a ton of information. That's good to hear that. The yeah, sorry to overwhelm you with so much, but it's kind yeah, of a it's... big, broad subject. But the, the, the reason there's so much is because it has so many different types of applications. You know, um, yeah. Part well, of what I, I did, think, uh... part of what I did originally when I was asking those questions myself about, you know, how would you be sustainable and stuff, I just looked and said to myself, and I'm sure you've probably done this too, because I, I think I even heard you mention something similar. But you start looking at what we actually use as humans on an atomic level, and what elements that we live most of our lives and it's actually surprisingly narrow <laughs> and, and exactly. you know what we do is we we you know get some set of elements that we get sent over here from china and we use it and break it and we throw it in the dump and then we go get some more of it you know <laughs> and uh, to me inherently it just doesn't make much sense you know an, an atom of silica or an atom of you know some hydrocarbon or whatever it, it, it's the uh, just as valuable after it's used as it was before or or pretty close. I mean, we use (laughs) some fractional piece of the energy out of it or something and then toss it away. So um, ultimately, you know, one of the things I've thought about is if you get back to kind of like I was talking about, you know, the the big picture of the geopolymer thing, but even just um, everything in general, if you could kind of break things back down to their atomic components and recompile them rather than uh, just throwing things away, it just seems like a seems like we're pretty close on the science to be able to start doing stuff like that and it right, just seems right, to right. make a lot more sense you know yeah a lot I mean, more sustainable it's kind of like atomic recycling maybe is what you'd call it <laughs> right 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 <laughs> you know oh, that's but, coming uh, that's, that's the next step yeah after digital fabrication but, yeah yeah, so i don't know I, I it seemed like there you know that there'd be quite a bit of application for you guys and i'm 
happy, you know, if, if you have some machines that you're going to push forward with, that, that I can give you some help on the materials that way, or, you okay. know, we're probably going to do some things like, you know, uh, some impact mills for milling down geologic materials and um, some screening, you know, I, I, I've talked with these guys that are doing this thing out in the desert, they're going to need to build a, either buy or build some kind of like small screening plant to classify uh, geologic materials just for, you know, building materials and you guys might need something like that, you know, just to be oh, able yeah, to go definitely. dig up dirt and, and pull out components and gravels and stuff like that. And um, they're you going see? to, uh, the geopolymers do take a little, well, they can, you can do it in standard concrete equipment, but ideally it takes a higher share mixing with the binder component to really get it to where it should be. And then you could use more of a standard mixer or even a higher share uh, type of concrete mixer like some of the vertical mixers and stuff are, are work better um so they may build you know i may help them build some of their own mixing equipment or stuff i mean that stuff when within the range of things they might do i'm not sure how much of that stuff that you guys what have already say, done or haven't done but, yeah uh, we're, we're building a hammer mill for our next brick press right now for a soil mixer so basically when you say impact mills are you talking about things like hammer mill yeah like a hammer mill yeah yeah, yeah. we're building that so i figured form. you might be doing some of the same yeah. things like that and that, that was one of the areas that i mentioned when i talked about uh like linings you know yeah. uh similar to that that was one of the applications like it you know maybe uh and this might be something you put higher energy into but like lucite uh, you know, a higher end ceramic fiber reinforced liner that is probably even fired and densified to use as a liner for a hammer mill for the wear plates and stuff like that, I think might be an application. Mm, yeah. Um, huh. yeah. I mean, I guess you could always use AR 400, you know, steel lining or something or AR 300 or whatever that is. But, uh, you know, I mean, ideally in the long term, if you could figure out a path to, to use dirt to <laughs> make a high strength liner for a hammer mill, that. Uh, or for a more people would blade. more be more affordable more people would have access to it in the long run yeah so. that would be great for bulldozer yeah. blades perhaps when you say help the people make some machines are you talking about you would actually be designing the machines or are you talking about getting people i, I might yeah, yeah I'm, i might be I'd, I'd rather not but, <laughs> uh -huh. but but i'm not scared off by building things i've been doing it my whole life so <laughs> what kind of things have you built like mechanically uh well, more of mine's in the larger stuff, and I don't mind the you know the transition over. But I, as far as on the on construction stuff, I built everything from a sewer treatment plant to the top of a roof of a house in mid-rise construction with mm -hmm. my hands, you know, before. So more more of my stuff's in civil construction and mm -hmm. you know infrastructure and, and stuff like that. And I built a ton of other stuff, I'm sure too. I mean, I built uh, electroplating machines and built electrolytes for them, and you know, done electroplating, and I built you know, aquaponic systems and aeroponic systems and stuff like that, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Mm -hmm. I built quite a few things over the time. I probably <laughs> forgot about a lot of them. Uh, you know, I built uh, I built some uh, small chain mill, ham, flail mills before, like a hammer mill. A lot of little things. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Don't really keep track. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. More than I should have. That's probably the correct answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, so, this is a flood. I have a tendency, it's, it's, it's probably that pioneer heritage that I have from being in, you know, Western United States. And, and my, I, I grew up in Washington State, and my family, and my, you know, my ancestors were all, uh, uh, they were, uh, uh, what do you call it, homesteaders and, and stuff like that, and out in the Western United, and kind of self-reliant people, and so... And I've always been kind of, uh, rather than uh, almost anything, it's like, well, if I can build it myself instead of buying it commercially, I'm always tempted. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm yeah. cheap, for one thing. I think uh, that kind of comes along with that heritage, too. They're, my ancestors were always too cheap, so we always just made do with what we had, built what you had to, and, you know, did things, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, ben, Probably a lot like you. I mean, you've, you've yeah. done plenty now. Uh, that's <laughs> similar type motivation yeah, yeah, and no, background, you know. Uh, similar that's very interesting uh so anyway this is great to talk to you um i'll think about some of the yeah, things if yeah, I could. it's been great to talk to you thank you for your time and uh and uh yeah if you uh, have anything that you, you know I, I would be interested with what you've done so far on the hammer mill i didn't see that you had plans on your site for that but that might be something that uh 
you know, uh, I could look at, you know, maybe we could use some of your design because I know that we want to build one and maybe I could work on, you know, doing some of the, get our side to maybe work and see if we could put together some of the reinforcing plates or something to work into oh, it. And we cool. could work on that part for you or, okay. I don't know. I mean, something like that might work or, um, I'm sure we'll figure out something that we can, um, try working on together. Oops, so. Excellent. Excellent. And yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Dan. So we'll we'll keep in touch and uh, yeah. appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it too. I, I guess one other thought for you yep. while I'm getting off. I'm looking at uh, you know letting you go. I, I'm looking at casting you know kind of modular housing and, and ultimately going that route. Mm -hmm. And um, you know I, I I get the compressed earth brick thing, mm -hmm. but with this kind of technology, if you had molds that were you know standardized and stuff you could pour like walls as a solid piece or potentially even like a whole room of a building if you had a mold, you know, with yeah. a two-part mold or whatever, you know, like kind of like they pour civil infrastructure, uh, you know, to pour super large uh, uh, catch basins and stuff, you know, that are, you know, or, or box, vault boxes and stuff like that that might be, you know, 10 by 20 feet or whatever. But uh, there is a methodology there that might be even simpler than compressed earth brick. Mm -hmm. Uh, for building houses, especially if you're using a mold that you use over and over again, um, that might even be less labor intensive. Just, just as a thought for you. I mean, that's kind of where I'm. Why the reason I'm ultimately looking at it for housing? Because I think there's some ways that that um, yes, appears could ultimately to be a... make something even stronger and, and probably quicker and easier than than you can with some of the more labor intensive things like uh, you know like brick. But uh, but you're obviously doing great things either way. But just something for you to think about in the yeah. meantime so yeah okay. anyway hey well i appreciate your time it's been great meeting you and uh i'll stay in touch and uh, i'll take another look at your website and see if i have any ideas i'll email you of, of, of things and then uh I'll, i might be making some uh binders for a couple people and stuff maybe i can uh and when I get a chance in the next couple of weeks, if I can work up a small batch of something that I could send out that, you know, is kind of already pre-mixed and with a catalyst with it or something just for you to play with, I'll, I'll uh, ship you something out. No, uh, just, be, you know, awesome. not, a, not a huge quantity, but just something that you can kind of yeah. start getting a feel for what it might be like, you know, without having to do too much work you're figuring out yourself. That sounds great. So. And just one, one more thing okay. on um, regarding... Sure the plans for next year's summer so this next year's summer we'll be doing three months of intense design builds on our site here so if there's something uh -huh. we can think up for that time we'll have a plan on having a lot of people here we can get a lot of stuff done but maybe uh, do some project or perhaps some build based on uh, what we can come up with because the one month of that sure, would be, be great i think it'd be really interesting yeah. if you got people there and something like that is if we could find some local precursors that you work with and just be able to show them here, here's how you can make a high strength material just out of, you know, waste materials and yeah. dirt or whatever else that yeah. you find locally, you know, well, let's, just to show them that it's possible and then maybe make something useful out of it. But I think that could be, you know, I, I could see that appealing to the, the type of people that probably come to your things. I yeah, assume. absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, uh, I would definitely be open to finding some local precursors and doing a batch of something just to show, what this is capable of and then that would be a start to to actually you know making refinements or making products out of that so that would be something yeah. quite interesting yeah that's something to think about yeah that, that okay. sounds sounds like it could be a good idea i'm happy to you know help in what ways i can so okay anyway hey okay. we'll have a great day and a weekend enjoy your holiday weekend and uh, i'm sure we'll be in touch soon okay thank you thank you very much Thanks. Take bye. care. bye bye